Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, August 30th, we discuss the Biden administration's housing policy moves. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have an excellent panel moderated by Mr. Ken Marcus, whom I'll introduce very briefly. Ken Marcus is the founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. He is the former assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, and he's the chairman of the Federalist Society Civil Rights Practice Group. And we're very pleased to welcome him and our excellent panel to discuss today's topic. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to the audience for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle questions as we can towards the end of this afternoon's program. You can enter those questions at any time, so please go ahead and use the Q&A to answer your questions. With that, thank you for being with us today. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you for putting this together and welcome to everyone uh, uh, joining us for the webinar. Uh, one other uh, aspect of my background that I'll mention because it's pertinent is that I am a former General Deputy Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Um, I say that because it took me quite a while to learn to say that with one breath. Uh, and also because I believe that uh, two other members of the panel have the same distinction of having had to learn to say that uh, title, having held the position uh, themselves at various times in, uh, in different uh, administrations. I'm so happy to be able to um, put a, a focus on the uh, Biden housing moves and in particular um, an important but not especially closely watched uh, area uh, in which he has uh, made an interesting policy change that I think requires uh, assessment. Uh, and that is uh, his new approach to affirmatively furthering uh, fair housing, uh, different uh, from the prior administrations um, and certainly uh, worth, uh, worth considering. We have uh, here uh, three experts on this topic. Uh, Brian Green, my uh, friend and former colleague uh, from uh, the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. We served together um, during the uh, George W. Bush administration. He was a senior executive in uh, career service while I was a uh, political appointee. Currently, he is the vice president of policy advocacy for the National Association of Realtors, where he oversees all legislative and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the association's 1.4 million members, but he formerly was the top uh, career official uh, at the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity for something like a decade, and so has um, some of the deepest uh, knowledge and experience in that area of, of anybody I know, and we're, we're going to be glad to welcome him in a moment. Uh, Daniel Hoff, uh, former counsel to the Senate and House Judiciary uh, Committees. Uh, I've had the Pleasure of working with him in various capacities over many years during both his House and Senate uh, backgrounds. But in addition, in 2019, he also was appointed a General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Enforcement um, at uh, HUD, overseeing a staff of 400 and working on issues that included affirmatively furthering fair housing. Dan also has the distinction of having looked at that issue from multiple perspectives, uh, including uh, from the time he worked uh, during President Donald Trump's uh, White House, where he also had an opportunity to work on the topic of affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, third, uh, Howard Husick, we are honored to uh, welcome. Um, uh, he has been um, a senior fellow for the Manhattan Institute, serving as vice president for research uh, and publications for a number of years. Uh, a City Journal contributing editor, he is the author of Who Killed Society? The Rise of Big Government and Decline of Bourgeois Norms and The Trillion Dollar Housing Mistake, The Failure of American Housing Policy, as well as numerous other articles, some of which deal directly uh, with the policy issues that we are going to discuss. So to look at this question of what is President Biden doing about housing policy, uh, and more generally, what does it mean to talk about affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, an issue that has had considerable uh, dissension, uh, but which is fundamentally important to the way in which our country deals with the issue of uh, discrimination and fairness in housing. We're going to start with uh, my former colleague, my friend, Brian Green. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Ken. And uh, it's great to see you. It's great to have served with you at HUD. And uh, if this panel proves anything, it proves uh, that there, there is life uh, after uh, serving as General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing for, for, for all of us. Um, I am at NAR, uh, the National Association of Realtors, as Ken points out, and um, I'm our Vice President for Policy Advocacy. And let me start by just saying a little bit about NAR and its support for fair housing and its support for affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, as Ken noted, you know, we represent uh, 1.4, actually now it's 1.5 million uh, realtors um, across the country. And we believe it's very important uh, that uh, we have an open housing market that serves all. And we recognize uh, that there are challenges um, in this country to serving all. Um, and many of those are historic challenges uh, and legacy issues. Um, and NAR uh, has uh, been very vocal in stating that it supports the Fair Housing Act. Uh, it supports aggressive enforcement of the Fair Housing Act. And it supports um, the implementation of all provisions of the Fair Housing Act including this provision that we're focusing on today, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, we ourselves, um, in recognition of the impact that um, the real estate profession has had in this country on segregation and uh, the wealth and equity we see today, uh, that is very much a product of past housing practices. Uh, because of all of this, um, the National Association of Realtors recently apologized as an institution uh, for its role uh, in creating uh, segregation in the country and uh, the wealth inequities that, that um, resulted from that. Um, we recognize that uh, we were strong supporters of racially restrictive covenants. We helped proliferate them throughout the country, uh, advocated for them. Uh, and people in the housing industry, of course, then went into government where much of these practices uh, were codified. Um, and uh, we, as the National Association of Realtors, um, opposed the Fair Housing Act uh, within the lifetime of uh, several of us here. Uh, and it was only uh, in my lifetime that the National Association of Realtors actually allowed African Americans uh, to become members of, of the Realtors. And so even starting my career, uh, a lot of this legacy was very much uh, raw. Uh, and of course, uh, there's no question that these practices uh, influence where we are today. Um, we just uh, issued a report um, looking at the profile of buyers and sellers this past year. And um, we see that of the people who were successful in purchasing homes, uh, only 5% of those were African-American, when we know African-Americans represent approximately 13% uh, of the country. Uh, what's fascinating is when you dig into this, and you can find it on our website, the African-Americans who were successful um, tended to be more qualified than white purchasers uh, in the sense that they had higher degrees of education. 30% uh, like of African-American purchasers last year had MBAs or JDs, you know, advanced degrees, while uh, whites who purchase clustered around folks with, um, with undergraduate degrees. Um, African Americans were also twice as likely to have student loan debt uh, and, and much more of it. And so they were purchasing, in many instances, um, overcoming many more challenges. And we know a lot of this was because uh, African Americans are not as capitalized because of a history of discrimination. Um, and so education, you know, which we see reflected in this, becomes key, um, uh, you know, African-Americans having to achieve more in order to uh, realize the same. And education, of course, was supposed to compensate for a history of um, exploitation and, and theft of, of wealth. Um, but what we're also finding now, and there was a big Wall Street Journal article about this, is that uh, many African-Americans, you know, with advanced degrees now are much more in the hole than their parents were and finding uh, this crushing student loan debt is becoming uh, even greater burden um, to um, mobility. 
So, uh, but this all comes back really to the fact that, you know, in our society, these things happened and uh, we never really uh, addressed them. We never took the affirmative steps or certainly not in time um, to, help, uh, to help close these gaps. And so that is, uh, you know, what one of the goals of affirmatively furthering fair housing was that uh, Walter Mondale and um, Senator Edward Brooke in sponsoring the Fair Housing Act and in um, introducing the provisions, the sort of thou shalt not provisions of the Fair Housing Act also um, said there are some affirmative steps we must do because uh, we created this situation and people really aren't going to overcome it unless we're more intentional or conscious in addressing the impacts of it. And that certainly we need to make sure that uh, federal funding going to communities um, is not used to further uh, exacerbate um, these historic issues. Um, and so that's you know, the focus today uh, really um, you know, what has affirmative, uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing been? What does it mean? Um, I had the opportunity to meet with um, Senator Mondale or Vice President Mondale, we'll call him, um, when he came back to HUD in 2015 to, to lay out what he intended. Uh, we also have the congressional record um, from Edward Brooke, you know, laying out, uh, you know, the intent uh, to address the legacy of discrimination and to ensure that the federal government um, is actively taking roles um, to promote <clears throat> what we used to call then integration, a word we don't talk, use so much anymore. Um, and, and I think, you know, what I want to emphasize, rather than getting into technical details, um, technical details, which I didn't particularly like getting into so much even when I was at HUD, is to, to underscore some main points. Um, the first main point is <clears throat> affirmatively furthering fair housing is a civil rights concept, that the purpose of it is to um, advance the fair housing uh, thrust of this law, that, um, we, that, that to overcome racial segregation in particular and uh, lack of opportunity due to race. Um, one of my concerns when uh, I listen to the public dialogue on uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing, and this I think this has been true from all quarters, <clears throat> is there, the focus seems to be overwhelmingly on low-income persons and um, assisted housing. And, and we do know that low-income um, issues and assisted housing issues um, can perpetuate segregation uh, a lot of the case law around affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, has involved um, the siting of uh, public housing or assisted housing. Um, but I, I really want to stress that um, AFFH is about racial segregation, uh, irrespective. You know, if the vehicle for segregation is affordable housing, that's important. But in this country, um, we are segregated you know, uh, in, in market rate housing, uh, overwhelmingly, um, you know, we do have suburbs that are now much more diverse than they were at the time of, uh, the fair housing act, but you have to break that down, right? I mean, we have entering suburbs that are, are um, uh, much more, uh, integrated, many of them even, um, predominantly people of color. Um, Ferguson was a suburb or is a suburb. Um, so we have many African-American, uh, predominantly African-American suburbs, even wealthy ones, uh, say Prince George's County, um, areas of, of uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but then we have, uh, you know, um, suburbs that are just really the run of the mill for America. And many of those are segregated. Uh, many have some degrees of integration, but uh, the suburbs are vast and um, you know, they're not a monolith. And so um, we are still addressing that. Uh, conversely, we have cities that are disproportionately uh, communities of color. Uh, so there is an imbalance. Uh, and so uh, we have to look at uh, the specifics when we talk about these issues. Um, and we have to look at causes. Uh, 
And that um, brings me to the, the, the main point about affirmatively furthering fair housing. It's about looking at causes. It's not looking at um, or mandating um, specific prescriptions. Um, the purpose is to examine what barriers exist uh, to determine what can you do about those barriers. Um, and then to set a reasonable course for what you can address. You know, theoretically, you could do this kind of analysis if you're getting federal money and, and not identify any barriers. That's unlikely. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a, a, a basically saying it's not enough to say, you know, uh, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Um, you've got you've to gotta look at the history of your community, um, what has uh, resulted in the segregation and what reasonably can be done to address it. You know, we know the story of many of our communities. We know the story, for example, of urban renewal and the impact of urban renewal on African-American communities. Um, and uh, in many of these instances, it didn't lead to integration. <laughs> um, it led to just another form of segregation in many of these communities. And again, more um, loss of, of wealth um, for, for many businesses uh, and individuals. And then we, uh, you know, individual cities uh, recently, many of them have begun to, to do this work and to identify like actual city related actions that they want to redress. And I think we can learn a lot from some of the, the uh, soul searching these different cities have gone through. I think many of you may have heard that Evanston, Illinois um, has looked at its history and how it specifically um, segregated African Americans into a small triangular area of the city and it recognizes uh, the long-term impact of that. I think they said they did this from 1919 to 1968, or at least uh, legally. Um, but uh, since that time, uh, they've said, all right, you know, what can we do? And there's been a lot of uh, evaluation of this effort to try to redress this past discrimination. Um, and you know, there are people of all different political stripes and different racial backgrounds uh, who disagree, <clears throat> and it's not predictable <laughs> where people necessarily come out on this, but that's the work, and that's what's important, to actually do the analysis, to have the debate, and to recognize that something should be done. And so that is really what affirmatively furthering fair housing is, that under law, uh, communities that receive federal funding are required to look at their history. Why do they have... Uh, segregated, um, why are they a seg segregated suburb or why are they a segregated municipality? Um, you know, are there legitimate reasons for it? Are there historical reasons that uh, the community has failed to address? As they're making new decisions, are they addressing uh, these issues uh, in their planning? Um, so to be conscious going forward. There are many cities uh, and communities historically who have uh, very consciously uh, announced that they want to be a welcoming community and they've planned that way. So you have like places like Shaker Heights, Ohio, you have Oak Park, Illinois, um, you have uh, Montclair, New Jersey, Montgomery County, Maryland, <clears throat> uh, Orange Maplewood. Most of these cities or communities <clears throat> are not segregated, in, I'm sorry, integrated incidentally. They made conscious decisions um, to promote this. So they do stand as examples that this can be done. And the final thing I'll say is um, we also just have to look at data. Data is important. Mapping is important. Um, much of the data that you see um, indicates how, uh, regardless of income group, however you look at this, <clears throat> there is a different reality for African Americans versus others. Um, of course, we have poor whites, uh, in many of our communities. But when you look at where poor whites live, <clears throat> they are much better integrated into communities. They're, they're seldom uh, into, uh, isolated. Blacks in most metropolitan areas are anywhere from 10 times or more isolated if they are poor. Uh, again, <clears throat> this is not about moving the poor uh, to other neighborhoods. It's about access and about fairness and whether uh, race is a determinant. And if it appears to be a determinant, what can be done about it? So that is still, I think, the unfinished business for affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, and um, we're very hopeful that the Biden administration uh, 
um, will take a thoughtful approach to this. And after 53 years, uh, affirmative, affirmatively furthering fair housing um, can take on some meaningful shape. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Green. I must uh, confess to have been uh, a little chagrined at the beginning of your talk when you confessed uh, that you did not enjoy the technical aspects of uh, fair housing, uh, even when you worked at HUD, uh, speaking as someone who relied on your technical aspects. Of fair, <laughs> I did it. The time. Uh, but you must have done a remarkable job of uh, muddling through despite the lack of enjoyment. Uh, and we thank you for your, uh, uh, for your insights. Thanks. Um, uh, Dan Huff, I know you have uh, thoughts on this issue and a, and a way of approaching it. Um, we'd love to hear uh, uh, from you now. Thanks, Ken. Uh, there's a popular internet meme that features two pictures side by side. One captioned how it started, and the other how it's going. And the point is to illustrate the often vast gulf between the intention behind something and how it operates in practice. When the civil rights bills were voted on, Hubert Humphrey, a chief sponsor, famously promised to eat the paper they're written on if they ever lead to quotas. And since then, the left has eagerly used those laws to impose quotas on our schools and businesses. And the affirmatively furthering fair housing or AFFH rule hits even closer to home, literally. It hands government bureaucrats that same top-down quota-based social engineering power over the communities where we all live. And here's how it works. Federal grantees are required by statute to certify that they will comply with the civil rights law, the Fair Housing Act, and that they will affirmatively further fair housing. Now, in context, it's clear that what this simply means is, yes, I'm going to follow all the laws and I'm going to use the money as intended. I'm going to build houses and not stadiums. But HUD says that this certification, this affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, these four words, rather, in the statute actually give it authority to impose a massive regulatory structure under which localities must submit demographic and historical information. And if the HUD bureaucrats deem it insufficiently diverse in that community, they have to eliminate their, their zoning laws or other uh, regulatory rules in order to enable construction of low-income high-rises next to single-family suburban homes. And I say this is wrong as a matter of policy, and it's wrong as a matter of law. As a matter of policy, zoning is good. Uh, it allows you to, to essentially preserve the look and character and feel of your area. So think about the DC height restrictions, right? It allows DC to maintain a more small town feel. Now you could say to me, well, historically or in particular situations, it can be used to exclude, look, there's a Latin legal maxim, abusus non tolet usum, improper use does not preclude proper use. And similarly, people tend to want to live among other people with whom they have much in common. This is natural, religion, culture, socioeconomic background. There's nothing invidious or unfair or unjust about a member of group A saying, look, I don't think anything ill of group B. I just want to live with group A because I have more in common with them. And the government has no business interfering in this sort of judgment. And the, the last point on the policy is that, look, the left is very strategic. They talk about high principle, but a lot of what this is about is putting low-income housing in the suburbs in order to turn red areas blue. And, you know, you could say, look, I'm too pure to make that sort of political judgment when I look at this policy. But the bottom line is you ignore it at your peril because the left's thinking about it. And if you don't uh, think about those kinds of considerations in the long run, you're going to lose. And if you talk to certain congressmen from certain areas, they'll all tell you that this is what's going on. But even if you don't agree with me as a matter of policy, the AFFH rule is definitely wrong as a matter of law. Now, discussion on this issue by advocates and, and the courts that look at it, it, it really it proceeds from a false premise. They say HUD is, is statutorily required to integrate communities. This is false. There's no such obligation. Now, what they'll do is they'll cite the legislative history. They'll talk about the, the chief sponsors, Monday and others, saying, well, you know, we want to achieve the truly integrated and balanced living patterns, and, and we want to end patterns of segregation. That's in the record, and they cite it all the time. But they're confusing the aims of the bill with the mechanism for achieving it. The legislative history makes clear that the, 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 the leaders of the, on those bills also make clear that while the aims were broad, the mechanism was narrow. And Mondale said, look, this obligation here, what we're really trying to do is, we're trying to do is eliminate the discrimination and the sale and rental of housing, quote, that's all it could mean. The idea was, look, once people, anyone who can afford a house can actually get to it and there's no restrictive covenant or other sort of barrier, that will naturally over time lead to the sort of integration we're looking for. So yes, the aims were broad, but the mechanism was narrow. It was not an invitation to some broad regulatory effort by the agency. And this is buttressed, by the way, by a general principle of admin law, which is 
uh, the major issues doctrine, right? The idea is that major policy issues should be decided by the entity that's sort of closest to the people, meaning the legislature and not agencies. And so the Supreme Court said, listen, if an agency wants to claim a broad grant of power, it's got to point to something explicit. It can't point to something vague, something like affirmatively furthering fair housing that seems in context to just be a perfunctory certification. So, you know, I think there's a case on that utility air regulatory group against the EPA. The bottom line is Congress is not presumed to hide elephants in mouse holes. In other words, it doesn't hide massive regulatory power in some vague phrase. But the most compelling and devastating argument against the AFFH rule is 12 U.S.C. 12711. Under the caption, Protection of State and Local Authority, the law says explicitly, the secretary shall not establish any criteria for denying funds based on the discontinuation by a jurisdiction of any public policy, regulation, or law. In other words, what? HUD can't tie grant funding to changing local rules. So look, I made these arguments at HUD, not a whole lot happened until I was at the White House. And I'm sitting there in the Oval Office with uh, James Bacon who worked with me. He's a really a young guy, but a really brilliant guy. And John McEntee who ran the Office of Personnel. And I don't know if you guys know him, but I've worked for McKinsey as a management consultant. I worked for senators and congressmen and I've never ever worked for a guy who's that good a leader. And we're sitting there and the president gets onto the housing thing. And John says, well, you know, my guys worked at HUD because James and I worked together. Uh, there and they know all about it. So we got to talking about it and the president said, look, I want this thing totally repealed, totally pulled out. Hard's been working on three and a half years. I want it gone. And James and I got together and we did it in 14 days. And we, res we essentially restored the original meaning. We did it so thoroughly that a friend of mine who still was at HUD was approached by a career who said, not in appreciation, but sort of in awe, like, wow, you guys didn't just get rid of the AFFH rule. You actually restored the statute to its original meaning when it was passed. And I say that as a badge of honor. And I think like, you can take three lessons from that. The first is that it's important to hire people who share your view because they'll go the extra mile to get something done. The key observation, the key thing that allowed us to do it in 14 days to put in that the, the, the new rule was realizing that we didn't have to go through notice and comment. The APA explicitly excludes from notice and comment requirements matters relating to agency grants, which is what AFFH is all about. So I presented this, I said, we don't need to do it. And people couldn't believe it. They didn't even know this thing existed. But the point is, if I didn't really believe in the project that the president wanted to do, I would say, sir, I wish we could do it, but the notice and comment is going to take months and months. But because I believed in it, I found a way to do it. So it's always important to hire people who, who, who see your view because they'll go the extra mile. The second lesson, I think, is that you shouldn't be afraid to explain what you are doing. Most of these major uh, regulatory actions that the Trump administration did were challenged in court, some successfully, some unsuccessfully. This is the only one I can think of that was at a major headlines that wasn't challenged. And I think it's because we laid out explicitly what we we're going to do, and we weren't afraid of people of what people might say about it. We didn't try to sort of hide what the real objective was because we were proud of what we were doing and thought it was defensible, which is exactly why we were doing it instead of trying to hide. When you hide, you have problems. And then the third lesson is, look, you have to be bold. Herodotus in his histories has uh, a discussion of sort of the bravery of the Spartans when they fought uh, uh, the Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae. And, and there, you know, bravery, heroism is not being afraid of death. But in modern political climate, the real heroism is not being afraid of being called, oh, racist, you know, that sort of thing. We were sitting in the Oval Office and someone says to the press, you know, sir, we can go through with this, you know, after we presented the whole thing. He says, but, you know, they're going to call you racist. And he, someone else echoed that point and he turned and he said, you know what, they call me that anyway. And I know a lot of people don't, you know, particularly like certain things President Trump says, but I got to tell you, like that sort of thing is true bravery in, in, in today's political climate. And it's a very rare thing in D.C. So. Bottom line is the Biden people have come back. They've restored the rule. It's essentially uh, the same thing with respect to the zoning. They're going to be doing more on it, too. And the question is, well, what is to be done? So I think uh, the easiest thing, really, really only thing we do, because we don't hold any any uh, senator House positions, is uh, is a lawsuit. And you can focus on the, the statutory sort of policy uh, substantive thing I said before, which is that there's a statute prohibiting tying funding to changing laws. But there's a second thing which you could do is that they didn't they didn't go through notice and comment either, but they didn't use sort of my method. What they did is they said, well, we're going to issue this as an interim final rule. And the admin law people here know that the APA allows you to avoid notice and comment uh, for good cause, defined as impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to public interest. But that sounds broad. It isn't. Impracticable means the rule's insignificant in nature and impact. 
Um, I'm sorry, in, in, impracticable means that it's responding to an immediate threat to public safety. Unnecessary really is limited to where the rule is insignificant, as I said, in nature and impact. And the public interest piece really means acute health or safety risk or some kind of situation where there's like a market shock that could create a danger of market manipulation. But none of those apply here. So you could attack it technically and you could attack it substantively. Uh, but I guess think in closing, there's like one more thing that I want to make a point of, which is that we've got to get smart and start seeing patterns. The AFFH rule, as I explained here, is an invention of the activists and bureaucrats following the same playbook they have used for decades to advance their controversial agenda on things from disparate impact to men and women's bathrooms. Now, what do you do? You use the democratic process to pass a modest bill imposing some limited requirements. You then work behind the scenes using the administrative process to expand the law to controversial areas well beyond what was agreed to. And finally, you collude with activist judges to rewrite the meaning of the law to pretend that the new expanded interpretation is really what everyone meant all along. It's a bait and switch. It's intellectually dishonest. It's operating in terrible bad faith. It's anti-democratic. And it and and the stupid, wimpy Republicans fall for it over and over again. We need to stop agreeing to the Democrats' seemingly modest civil rights proposals because I guarantee you that whatever you think you're agreeing to, it's going to wind up being 10 times that by the time the activists and the bureaucrats and the fellow traveler judges are done. So with that exhortation, uh, I see my uh, time has expired and I yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. Thank you for your service and thank you for your passion and for your uh, words as, as well. Uh, the Federalist Society, of course, does not take uh, positions or uh, uh, support uh, political uh, parties or candidates, uh, but we know that uh, uh, members of the audience often do. And so we, uh, uh, we thank you. Uh, speaking of members of the audience, I just want to uh, observe that uh, not only do we have a very distinguished panel, um, uh, but uh, we have uh, quite a distinguished uh, group of people um, uh, watching as well, um, or else people whose names closely resemble others who are <laughs> distinguished, but one way or the other. Uh, if you are in the audience and have a question, you uh, should feel free to add it to the Q&A, and we will uh, look, that, look at them at the end. Now, uh, Howard Husick, uh, we, uh, we've enjoyed uh, your work on paper and look forward to hearing your remarks uh, at this point. Thank you very much, Ken. I have to say I'm... Uh, motivated to say to Dan, tell us what you really think. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'll bracket that by saying, uh, just as you wanted to add, Ken, some pertinent facts about yourself, I, I'm now a senior fellow at uh, the American Enterprise Institute. They'd be mad at me if I didn't mention that. And I have a new book coming out on housing called, provocatively, intentionally, The Poor Side of Town and Why We Need It. And uh, I will circle around to how that relates to our discussion here. Uh, uh, let me start by saying uh, my thought process always when it comes to uh, housing discrimination is what is best for African-American aspirations and upward mobility. I think that has to be, rather than protecting any particular status quo, I think our focus always has to be what really will advance the interests of African-American people. And my concern about affirmatively furthering fair housing as it is implemented is that it joins a history of government interventions in the housing market that have actually worked uh, adversely to those interests. And uh, Brian alluded to some of those, but I'll elaborate a bit. So there's no doubt that redlining and the FHA rules that the realtors were uh, complicit with uh, had a deleterious effect on, on black people. But we should not minimize, and it relates to affirmatively for the fair housing, government interventions, there were allusions to urban renewal. Public housing not only was poorly maintained, much of it eventually actually demolished, it replaced healthy black communities. In my book, I talk about an area of Detroit called Black Bottom that referred to the French soil when they came there and started Detroit, not to racial matters. This was an area of high percentage of owner occupied structures, 300 black owned businesses, mutual aid societies, churches, including the church owned by Aretha Franklin's father, completely demolished. It's now the Chrysler Freeway. Government intervention did that. It was replaced by the Douglas, Frederick Douglas houses. Imagine naming something for Frederick Douglas. Eleanor Roosevelt came there. 
she was convinced this same kind of benevolence that concerns me. She was convinced if we had a public housing project explicitly for African Americans, that was the kind of benevolence that would provide a better environment. Its effect was to strip them of wealth, to prevent wealth accumulation. Property ownership is the key to uh, wealth accumulation. So we have to be, my point here is not to rehearse the arguments about public housing, although I, I do enjoy doing that, uh, but to recall that government interventions in the housing market are complex and we have to be very careful about them. And that's what gets me to affirmatively furthering fair housing. In effect, and I totally agree with Brian Green that there's been a disproportionate focus on low income and subsidized housing as the uh, uh, embodiment of fair housing. But that has been the reality. We may wish, and I certainly wish, that fair housing were restored to the idea that anybody who can afford to own or rent should be able to. Should we test realtors on that? Yes. Should the federal government support that kind of testing? I have no problem with that. Anybody who can afford a home should be able to own or rent it wherever they want to live. That's really crucial. But if you go back to the Obama administration ori origination of the new iteration of fair housing, it focused on, and I'm not overemphasizing this, on moving poor people to what they called higher opportunity zones. The only way to do that was through public and subsidized housing. That is not only a recipe for controversy, it's bad for the people who it's intended to help. Just as public housing was bad for the people it was intended to help. You don't accumulate wealth when you live in subsidized housing. That's the nature of it, right? And the idea that we have to move poor people to wealthier areas in order for them to have opportunity, that's the the opposite of what HUD was created to do in the first place, which was to improve urban areas. We need to make sure that every neighborhood is a high opportunity area. We're never gonna be able to move all the poor people to rich areas. That's not gonna happen. We can't confuse that with the core idea of what makes housing markets fair, which is non-discrimination, non-discrimination. So we need to make sure that schools are good everywhere, that public safety is good everywhere, that parks are clean and safe everywhere. There should be no high and low opportunity zones. Now, turning it more directly to the mechanisms of AFFH, they're tied to community development block grants, for instance. That was certainly part of what the Obama era would do. The now is talking about expanding those kind of contingent grant making to transportation and Senator Booker and, and Representative Clyburn have a bill uh, in that regard to link federal funding to a range of local rulemaking as, uh, as Dan Huff alluded to. There are only 1200 communities in these United States that receive community development block grants. Most American communities, including the, you know, shall we say overwhelmingly white communities are insulated from that kind of intervention. Even some of the, the um, uh, poster boys for integration, like uh, Brian referred to Shaker Heights. I'm extremely familiar with Shaker Heights and I've done research there. Their interest was not to help black people. It was to balance, to make sure not too many black people moved in. That's really what, they, and they had a whole plan to move black people to other suburbs. So, this government intervention idea can be very, very complicated. In my opinion, zoning, I know Dan defended zoning and zoning has its place, but zoning is too restrictive in this country in terms of helping housing supply of a range of types. This is what we need. We need a greater spectrum of housing types, which we once had in this country in the pre-World War II eras when two family, three family, four family homes were more complex, zoning eliminated those in the post-war era. I don't believe that the federal government should use its heavy hand of contingent grant making 
to change that reality. First of all, it wouldn't affect that many communities. What we need to do is what the original advocates of zoning did beginning in the 1920s, which is to persuade local planning boards across the country. It's in the interest of your community to have a range of housing types. So your children can live in the communities where they grew up. So police, firefighters and teachers can live in the communities that they serve because there's a natural affordability of small homes on small lots. I believe that one of the collateral benefits of that would, would be to make a wider range of housing available to low income persons of all types, but especially African-Americans, because as Brian pointed out correctly, low income African-Americans have fewer housing choices, not necessarily because of racism, but because modest homes for people of modest incomes are restricted in this country. We need not use and should not use the heavy hand of government. Remember that questionnaire that, that uh, uh, Dan referred to that the Obama era HUD used had 93 questions, 93 questions. Philadelphia's submission for the AFFH uh, uh, qualification was 800 pages long. HUD Secretary Fudge has said, well, we're going to step back from that questionnaire, but well, we'll see. That kind of heavy handed intervention is going to make it difficult for small communities even to comply, and it will starve them of funds they need to really help low income persons, which is what CDBG is meant to do. We need to have a broader spectrum of housing types. We need to advance the interests of poor black people, but I'm very skeptical that affirmatively fair, furthering fair housing is the best way to do that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Howard. So there's a lot in there, and I certainly hope that there will be a discussion of some of the areas in which you agreed and some where there was clearly uh, a disagreement. But I, I want to make sure that there's clarity on one point that maybe I should have established at the beginning. And that's about what the Biden administration has already done or not done on affirmatively uh, furthering fair housing. Uh, Dan mentioned that uh, the Trump administration's work was not uh, challenged uh, in court, much less uh, judicially um, uh, overturned. Uh, nevertheless, it has been reported uh, and it appears that uh, President Biden's administration uh, has restored um, a requirement that communities take steps to reduce racial segregation or uh, lose federal funds, but stop short uh, of uh, returning to uh, the full mandate uh, imposed during the Obama administration in uh, 2015. Is that, uh, is, is that report, uh, is that the, the sort of Washington Post and other media uh, uh, entities reporting? It, it, would you agree that that's a fair summary? In other words, that after the Trump administration, the Biden administration has gone back a notch, but not completely as far as where the Obama administration was. That's my understanding. And the specific uh, uh, questionnaire, which I characterize as burdensome, is not being used. However, I also have, it's also my understanding that this is an interim step and they're, they're uh, taking stock. Okay. And I would agree that's right. Um, they are sort of focusing on sort of the concept at this point, uh, you know, that it's a fair housing requirement, not an affordable housing requirement, and that deals with a broad range of issues. Um, but how they're going to ultimately implement it, we, we don't know. And, and let me just say, the National Association of Realtors was not a big fan of the 93 page or 93 questions either. Um, you know, I think the more simple <laughs> um, we can get to these points, the better. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm hopeful that uh, the Biden administration has also learned from that experience. And oh, Ken, well, from, yeah, I do, I do want to hear from you, uh, Dan, say whatever you want to say, but whatever else you say, I'm interested uh, to hear whether you uh, felt that there was some vindication uh, from the Biden administration of what the Trump administration did in that they did not go all the way back to Obama, or whether it's your thought that this was just a step and the fact is that they're going uh, entirely in the wrong direction. 
No, it's, it's just strategic. It's the wrong direction. And it, the, the, to the extent it's different, it's different in certain particulars. But with respect to the points I made, the central points of HUD's lacking authority, total misinterpretation of HUD's authority, and the violation of the specific statute prohibiting this, and sort of the broad idea that they shouldn't be meddling in zoning, all the big points I made, there is no difference. In fact, if you look at the rule, page 36, they uh, talk about the overcoming patterns of segregation, replacing segregated living patterns with truly integrated living patterns. The same thing that I quoted, that floor language that looks at the broad aims, but, but ignores the fact that the mechanism is narrow. So they're already in that mindset. And most importantly, the rule reinstates a 200-page guidebook. If you look on page 31 of the rule is posted, you'll see that there, that uh, they're reissuing this 200-page guidebook in which the, the word zoning is mentioned 82 times. And if there's any questions to like what they're really aiming at, it's exactly what I said. Look at the June 10th, Washington Post op-ed by Secretary Fudge, where she stated that the new rule will require, quote, every local government that accepts federal housing dollars is supposed to take concrete steps such as relaxing restrictive zoning codes. That's what they're after. In the big picture, it's exactly the same. There's no vindication. It's business as usual for the, you know, the Obama-Biden administration. Now it's the Biden-Harris. Good. So are we in a discussion moment? Or yes. If anybody else on the panel <laughs> cares to add anything in response to anyone else, Brian or others, this is the time. So, you know, I don't know how much has been reported on the uh, AFFH submissions that HUD accepted uh, before the rule was rolled back, but I don't believe in connection with any of them. Well, I'm not, I'm understating it. HUD did not, you know, direct anyone to change their zoning um, in those admission, in those submissions. Uh, it is a process whereby the uh, communities um, you know, reviewing however many pages of guidance HUD provides and questions that they ask them to address, they answer those questions and then they decide uh, where they believe they can move the needle um, to affirmatively further fair housing. And there are many civil rights advocates who found that actually weak tea because um, it was not at all prescriptive. Um, the only prescriptive element is you've got to ask yourself these questions. Um, and so I think, I think it's important to underscore, you know, when people talk about moving people from one area to the next, maybe people fear that's going to be the consequence of doing this exercise, but HUD did not direct any communities that they must move their poor uh, into new areas. This is not like a you know, Australia in the 1940s, you know, resettling people. Um, but what it is asking people to do is to examine the historical patterns. Uh, and it does identify, you know, what it calls high opportunity areas and all, all those different things as part of the analysis to, to determine whether people have access. And it challenges them to identify ways they can uh, promote that kind of access. But it doesn't say you must. Um, and then I guess the last point, um, I, I think everything that, that Howard shared in terms of, you know, different housing types, you know, while the, the, the affirmatively furthering regulations from the Obama administration, and I, I don't expect the, the, the Biden administration, won't dictate zoning. And I can talk to you more about that because, <coughs> you know, it's actually explicit that they cannot uh, dictate zoning. It asks communities to look at zoning. And if they were to look at zoning... Um, some, you know, by their own volition, might choose to undertake something like what Howard proposes. I think many people appreciate and, exp and, and respect that uh, zoning presents a challenge and that if they had uh, communities that allowed for these different housing types, just market rate housing even, um, that it could make a difference. And that would satisfy, you know, if a community, you know, chose to do that, that would demonstrate to HUD that uh, they are taking a step to affirmatively further fair housing. It's not a requirement that they take that step, but that is certainly, I think, you know, intuitively, Howard um, you know, acknowledges that could make a difference. And I think a community that, that did that would actually be very aggressive um, relative to what uh, communities currently do. Um, so, uh, and many communities are now doing, I mean, the state of California just passed a law to allow uh, for two unit um, housing in the entire state. That's a huge step for the state to affirmatively further fair housing. That's probably light years beyond what anyone has done to affirmatively further fair housing. 
they don't have, I, 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 that doesn't mean then they have to like, you know, do something with their public housing as well. That's, a, you know, if, that, if that's the, the huge lift they've uh, decided to, to make, that is significant in, in, um, in making progress towards that goal. So less than 10 minutes, others may have comments and there's at least one or two questions, but I do want first, Brian, to uh, maybe um, push you a little bit if I'm, I may and give you an opportunity. Um, so there are some who will say, okay, so maybe HUD is not specifically telling communities, you must change zoning in a particular way, but isn't HUD actually muscling them in a fairly easily understood, if not explicit way, to make those changes? Uh, does one really have to be explicit in saying you must do X, Y, and Z in order to accomplish that goal? Is this not simply a means for HUD to pressure communities to make these changes without actually uh, sort of uh, being accountable for it? No, I hear what you're saying. If, if the submitted and approved um, affirmatively furthering for housing submissions from those communities that went through it are on the web, I'm sure they did not all propose zoning changes. HUD accepted, the, HUD accepted what they said they would do. <laughs> um, uh, HUD is you know, acknowledging what our history acknowledges, that zoning has been used to discriminate and that it's one of many things communities can look at. Uh, the Trump administration, before it reversed course, actually had uh, an initiative, an executive order to evaluate zoning um, and rec in recognition that zoning and other regulatory barriers were driving up um, home prices and was also using um, carrots uh, to try to change uh, or influence communities to make zoning changes. And then something happened to that, you know, but that the Trump administration was also recognizing the impact of zoning. That's what it is. And I am willing to bet <laughs> that HUD will not direct communities uh, to change their zoning or require it. Uh, and that many communities will affirmatively further fair housing without touching zoning. Okay. Ken, if I might just add, um, the questionnaires that were filled out and the responses, the denials that were issued would often refer to things like, well, your schools are placed in a way that doesn't make it possible for low income students to get to high opportunity schools. Well, as per what you were saying, Ken, that can lead you to think about zoning and whether you have multifamily housing near particular schools. But my big concern is, and vis-a-vis -vis California, which is a terrific point, we have a spontaneous change going on in this country where zoning is being reflected upon by local and state officials as something that is harming the housing market by being too restrictive. The, the idea that this is, this is not a new idea. Secretary Kemp in the first Bush administration issued a landmark report too often ignored called barriers to affordable housing. <laughs> this is an important idea, but if HUD comes down hard on communities, they will create a backlash, a resentment that will be counterproductive. We're starting to see a, a flowering of rethinking and we need to let it happen. If HUD wants to issue you know, it's ideas and people want to consider them. Well, that's fine. But anything that is the heavy handed arm of the federal government is going to have a counter effect that would be counterproductive. Thank, thank you, Howard. And thank you, especially for the way in which you address one of the uh, questions from the audience uh, in the course of your, your response. Dan, uh, I, I, I see you wanted to uh, share something. Yeah, I, I'm not sure where all of this comes from. The, the fact of the matter is that, that HUD did tell the Westchester County, which was really the forerunner of all the safe fixing, that they must pass a zoning ordinance. And there was a settlement that required them to do so. Furthermore, they were required to build low-income housing in higher-income areas. HUD has has done it already and they'll do it again. And 
I just told you that you have this Washington Post op-ed where the secretary said that essentially the point of this rule, and she highlighted changing zoning laws. And as for this point that, well, they didn't tell you you specifically how to do it. Look, that's not how things work in the real world. They set the broad goal. The broad goal is, it says in the statute, you have to overcome barriers to building low-income housing, which they call by the euphemism affordable housing. That's the goal. You have to do it. And if you want federal government money, you better do it. Oh, and what do we think is a barrier? Well, we think zoning is a barrier. But, you know, you could look at other stuff if you want. Well, if you're trying to get that money, what are you going to do? I mean, this is silly talk. Obviously, they're pointing at zoning. They're saying they're saying change things. That's going to that's how they force them to do it. They never tell them explicitly to do it. That's the bureaucratic way. That's how things work. Well, we can look at we can look at the ones that were accepted and verify that. That's not a good example because that the AFFH rule wasn't uh, didn't come out till 2015, and the Trump administration had come in uh, at 2016. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, at late 2016, the Trump administration came in, and there was already talk about changing things dramatically. And so, whatever the, the sort of the implementation was not done by the people who created it; it was done by people who were much more hostile to it. Well, maybe we're looking at the heavy hand of HUD and the, the three of us here. I, I just think people are overstating. <laughs> Uh, just how heavy handed HUD is. Uh, they they uh, did it in Westchester. Look what they did in the Westchester was, litigation. But that was a settlement, Dan. It was a settlement they based on the fact that the, yeah, but but the, essentially the, the logic behind it was the same. I'm sorry? Yeah, based on apparent violations. I mean, I, I think there are different, you, there are different approaches you can take during a settlement, but um, HUD was the, actually even directed by Congress because, because of this very fear to ensure that it did not prescribe zoning. And the, the folks who were writing the rule were like, well, we never were going to prescribe zoning, so absolutely. But, but I, 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 I once again stress, there were accepted submissions um, where zoning was not, um, the, you know, where they did not direct the change in zoning. I, I, I'll just jump in. You can, on, you can on, believe me or not, but I never heard that discussed at, 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 by anyone at HUD like we're going to force these changes. Uh, there's respect for local zoning laws. Yeah, I'll just, if I we might have one, one minute left, and I'll give it to Howard. Well, I'll just jump in on Westchester since I live in Westchester and I wrote a an ex extensive essay about that situation for City Journal. The effect of the Westchester County settlement. That's where the HUD talked about moving people to high opportunity zip codes. The idea that there were these wealthy communities that had no uh, uh, low-income persons. The effect of that was to build 750 uh, units dispersed around the county at a cost of $68,000 additional subsidy per unit by the taxpayers of Westchester. So it was a very dramatic intervention. And HUD was key in that. They were a party to it. So that did reveal something about what can happen. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for sharing your time, your wisdom. And thank you also to Evelyn Hildebrand for your uh, support to the Civil Rights uh, Practice Group uh, and for helping to put all of this together. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Me. And I'll just add the thanks of the Federalist Society to our panelists, to our moderator, to our audience for sending in your questions and participating this afternoon. If you have any questions or feedback, please send that in at info at fed-soc.org. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Uh, thank you all for participating today. We are adjourned. <laughs>